of our work is different in the scheme of like telling, I guess. So um, we're trying to break the paper down in like four different parts, um, I guess. So the first part is like, can't answer what is intelligent. So how do we go from here to be able to answer, uh, or help us get a better understanding of what intelligence is? Um, and then what we found out that we don't want to define it, we want to describe it. So we're going to try and take our uh, three different viewpoints um, and then go to part two and try and focus on the question is how does uh, process play a role in intelligence um, from our three different standpoints to then describe um, the three, like what's similar in the three viewpoints, which is part three, and then part four is hopefully agree on our three different viewpoints about how we can apply our views to intelligence. Do you, you want to describe what you mean by process? Ah, sure. So, um, if you click on current post two response to the agent post two. Which one, sorry? Uh, that, the one right now. That one? Right there, yeah. Uh, and scroll down. There's the, where I found out uh, Richard and I are kind of talking on the same, same wavelength with this. Mm -hmm. I brought up Marshall McLuhan. Um, and the medium is the message. Uh, and then I tried to make a distinction further down uh, between the difference between what is what is the medium versus what is the process. And I think we all have similar processes when we do work, but the medium that we're working in is different. Right? If that's what I get from McLuhan at least. Um, but th this ties right back into the things Patrick's been talking about with that. Or this, or the, the, our, Breaking things down into the materiality, the process, the um, and the auxiliary purpose. Thing. Oh, the, uh, the the structure of Aristotle's causality. Aristotle Newton's Aristotle, yeah, called that. So that that way of describing things seems yeah. to be the. If I'm hearing you right, a very similar thing that you're doing. Yeah. Here. Yep. Um, so I guess my viewpoint, my uh, is the language, uh, what we use when we're talking about intelligence. So in Smith's. Uh, history of <coughs> that you posted, he doesn't define, they don't define AI in that paper at all. But on page six, there are, I think, like eight different ways that he describes what intelligence can be. And he uses qualia, intentionality, all of these different things to describe what intelligence is. And then doesn't choose any one of them. No. He just gives you a little So I don't, I don't think it's so much the question that Harvard is trying to put, uh, figure out what is intelligence trying to describe and what, uh, I guess, describe that of what intelligence is. An existential look at, which is an essential look at intelligence. Does that make sense? So that's kind of the overview of what our group is doing. And we're talking about networks, too, and I think that's how the honest approach. <laughs> so there's a bunch of different levels. What you said is just really quite wonderful because without perhaps realizing it, you're, uh, you're in, in embodying in the way you're thinking uh, a kind of standard discussion of intelligence. Uh, and actually, in the essay that I was uh, speaking not too highly of uh, today by Richard Cox, Richard has a beautiful brief display of the paragraphs I was referring to that are really good. There are a couple of very fine paragraphs there about intelligence. One of the things that he says is, well, as machines, computers are basically rule following uh, systems, rule following procedures. And uh, he's going to basically say, well, an intelligent, a sign of intelligence is when you know not to follow, when, when not to follow the rules. Right? So when, by, by zeroing in on this, trying to answer the question about intelligence by thinking about the process and noticing that your process has regularities, but also uh, moments uh, where those regularities are broken or fractured or switched up in some way, you're actually uh, it very much discovering sort of this, one of the standard uh, uh, conversations that philosophers have about what constitutes intelligence itself. So you're, 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 it's really intriguing that you're, that you're finding this as you go. It's quite wonderful. There's one other little thing to, to think about. Whenever you identify, uh, one of the insights that led to uh, structural linguistics uh, was a very simple one. That wherever you have a process, there's, there's a system underneath it. Okay? And so, uh, so by, by mapping out a process, 
you can then think about, well, what, are, what is the system that, that, that gives rise to that process? And uh, that, that way of thinking, that habit of thinking, really was the key to, uh, to creating structure, the early stages of structural linguistics. And that's, that's Levy Strauss. Uh, Jim Slev, I think is how to say his name. And it was, but uh, but Levy Strauss is drawing on him too. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> well, obviously, as soon as you told me you were trying to answer that question, you know, that just seems way too big. But the way you seem to be attacking it is quite, um, it's fairly focused, and I like the fact you're drawing on your own experience as well. I really like that. Well, I think of it, one other interesting thing about what you're doing, what is the difference, what, when we often talk about the difference between an object and a person, okay, one of the things that we say is, well, a person is, an, is intelligent and an object isn't. Well, what's the indication of, of that person's intelligence? Well, one of the answers is that as a person, I can arrange and organize my world. I can engage in these things that you're calling process. And that's, that's what makes me a person, okay? What, what, what uh, uh, we often say about objects, but I think it's wrong, is that objects don't organize their world. It's okay. funny, I attended a lecture yesterday by an interview candidate for the electrical and computer engineering. And he was talking about intelligent searching of radio wavelengths for frequency bands. And he had a program, he called it cognitive, and he said to make it intelligent, it must have two things. He said, um, a mechanism for learning and a mechanism for organization, where he's two, but from a very computational point of view, that what we would call intelligent as a system was learning and organization, so that tie straight back in this similar thing. When you were even indicating it earlier tonight, when we were talking about the, um, you know, trying to standardize the rules for robots using mm -hmm. the Google, you know, on data stuff. It seems to me that, that that, in a way, is moving in the same direction, right? Where, um, if, if you think about the Netflix, your example of the Netflix preferences, in a way, that's a, that is a, a program for uh, organizing, uh, for, for organizing. Organizing uh, information. Information. Organizing and presenting. Ordering it for, uh, for action, for a decision of some kind. So what we are seeing is that uh, the, the more sophisticated our, our computer systems become, uh, the more likely it is that they will come closer and closer to what we traditionally recognize as intelligent activity. Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, any other comments or questions on this one? Well, you guys have to get involved in this discussion as well. <coughs> Not just the two of us. Who else, who hasn't spoken yet? The, uh, at the back? One here. So, um, well, we do have some stuff on that group, uh, also under discussion. Is there, I can't find an easy way to jump backwards in this here. So people, groups, and what group are you? First. First one. All right, we're in. Do you have stuff, well, an announcement? Yeah, we have uh, some under discussions right there. Discussions. Um, we have a little bit of Oh, my word. Look at that. They're off. And Donna Haraway. Yeah, oddly enough, it didn't have anything to uh, deal directly with it. Kind of Tell us about your question first. Well, basically, we started out with what is a singularity? Well, we can't write a library in the span of a few weeks here. Mm -hmm. So we started looking at some specific definitions. Obviously, you've got, uh, you know, all Ray's definition of singularity. But going from there, he didn't invent it. He just popularized one idea. So under the, I came up with some examples of what could be seen as a singularity. Uh, and I just pushed it up not too long ago. So, so are you are you concentrating on the definition? Part of, part of that is, um, and we're also going to be examining uh, the different examples of uh, a definition of it. Uh, Brian wants to talk about the uh, the ethical implications of each of the examples, which really is sort of raises the gambit of you know positivism, fascism, to all sorts of 
terrible, terrible things. Yeah. The guy's inventing the end of the world, isn't it? Yeah, it's sort of really scary. Like, there, there's a really dark angle to singularity, even if you're not looking at sort of a great new situation, because human beings, if we're all united in intelligence, there's, like, we're all equal, then who's going to be our, di our ditch diggers? So a group is, has to be excluded from the singularity to exist, and there's a lot of horror that can be drawn from that. Yeah. Yeah, the singularity, there's, the language is interesting because a singularity, almost by its very nature, implies everyone is involved. It's this ultimate, um, and in reality, that's not how anything in the world has ever worked in the past. So, the, the way I sort of see the comedy with calling the singularity is it's sort of one entity, but it's also sort of like a black hole in that it is entropy. Because once I, I feel that this is a personal belief that once we get to this sort of singularity level, as is defined by sort of like futurists rather than the whole every time we have a big technological revolution, we sort of reach the singularity aspect, we'll collapse in on ourselves. Because we'll reach a level where the you know like ambition and progress there wouldn't be so much of an incentive for that, and all the sort of human emotions and just anger and stuff will collapse and we're going to kill each other. <laughs> One uh, thing with the examples I was going over was this idea of uh, why do we assume humans are going to be the focus of that singularity? Uh, machines could attempt to achieve that, and then. What happens when they no longer need humans at that point? They can just send us off like a virus or whatnot. There's so much, so much in the language here. Yeah. You know, um, I like need is an interesting phrase in this. You know, what do you mean by need humans? Um, also, um, the very an examination of the language associated with the singularity is really interesting about the positive, negative aspects, the ethical, the social implications, all really interesting subjects, you know, are worth worth investigating kind of further. Um, it sounds like you still need to focus on one particular question or yeah, we're something. Still it down a little bit. Yeah, you need to would you say that, Patrick? Probably well, need to. What are you it. writing about? Under the, what should our the question our be? Question? Yeah. What, 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 uh, what sort of uh, <clears throat> comments are there? The hours are. Or or everything is kind of uh, in different. It's, it's kind of a little chaotic with where some of our information <clears throat> is. Well, we started with that, and then we had the media examples one. So it's kind of split over uh, quite a, a different amount here. Mm -hmm. I just know whenever we find crowds, so our definition, I will be able to find something more than that. Oh, so, yeah, that's yeah. Um, Are you just, just uh, oh, sorry, man. Oh, yeah. Which is actually partially why I, uh, I mean, it would be so easy just to stick with uh, Ray's idea of the singularity. So the more I read, the more, you know, it made apparent, as much as he loves to take credit for the idea, um, he's not the first to come up with the aspects or anything just because he popularized the name. And then each scenario, uh, as I was going through, uh, for examples, uh, my mind's like, yeah, I can see how this one could go wrong in completely, in completely different directions for all of them. Um, can you think of some, uh, uh, or can you just help me understand what would be a precursor to his idea that he's uh, borrowing from? You have a, well, um, example here. You may not be able to recall it right now. Yeah, yeah. As I said, I got through so, uh, so much reading the morning I did the more, you know, I was uh, looking at a different question. But as I said, the thing is, I said before, the thing that struck me the most was uh, Ray's, def you know, old definition here is, you know, humanity is the core of the singularity. Um, and, you know, sometimes technology is going to, you know, revolve around us or whatever. That's not necessarily the case, or humanity as we are now or whatever. For those of us in the room who might not really, we have some sense about what he means by singularity. Can you yeah. just kind of be a little more specific uh, for how you're, right. you're in his term? Uh, it's like, it's sort of like a big technological revolution where things are sort of redefined. Like, that's a very vague way to say it, but uh, consider the printing press as a singularity. All of a sudden, almost instantaneously overnight, information can be distributed on so many levels to a wide variety of people. The plantation system could be considered a singularity because all of a sudden we're able to 
have enough of these resources that we can start mass producing things, and this leads to factories and stuff. And if you look at, like he brought up a bunch of charts that we met, if you look at uh, like the current rate of technological development, <coughs> singularity is always just around the corner because we always just keep inventing more and more things. It's sort of like a, like a snipe line. It's just a way to say we're continuing advanced. Well, one thing about uh, Critchwell's definition here is he has this idea of, of exponential growth where um, basically he, he thinks that basic, uh, our technological development is going to get to a point where it's going to be one solid vertical line, um, contrary to you know, plenty of other things established in physical laws. Where everything is just going to merge together. We're going to be part of, we're going to, you know, technology, humanity is just going to be one thing. And we have to, you know, essentially kind of control over everything. Um, again, he gets to a point where he's more, you know, new age religion versus actual science, which is, you know, one of the biggest kind of complaints about him. Um, but at the same time, he's so um, enthusiastic about it. It's still, it is book is an interesting read. Um, but yeah, he, it, there's a lot of assumption in his definition, which is why I wanted to go look at other ideas. Um, the examples are pretty good, and then looking for academia to kind of back up some of those ideas. I think um, one of the things you're going to have to be very careful with this project is that you don't end up giving us descriptions of the singularity. Yeah. You know, that's not what we're looking for exactly. here. We're looking, we, we need you to focus on an aspect of it and look deeply using the kind of techniques we're, we've been talking about. So make sure that you're, that you're talking in that way. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I feel like the sort of definition that we, I don't think we actually agree now that this sort of what we all been saying is that singularity is when all of a sudden mass information for a lot more people than previously. Yeah. And, you know, like, I think a recent example, and this is what I've got a lot of, like, academic sources on so far, is, uh, like, think of the iPhone boom, or the whole, we can now have computers everywhere boom that happens mm. every year. And then consider, like, Foxconn and all these people who are essentially in slavery, but we're not calling it slavery because they get paid to have enough food to live on, maybe. <laughs> and how there's sort of this out of sight, out of mind, part of it, which I think will, you know, that could break into an actual futurist singularity. And then there's also the part where even if people know their want for the product does outweigh the fact that humans are suffering for it. And I think that's very fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, you're looking at a lot of different things here. So, you know, you may need to, to come up with, with something coherent as an argument or as a or are you fundamentally disagreeing with each other in some way? Just to some extent. We're, we're still we're narrowing it down. On the which is good. We, so we like disagreements. Where are your disagreements? Well, I'm, um, as I said, since I wanted to uh, come up with the different ideas of singularity, that's where I started to approach it from. He wanted to go straight to the ethics and things. So that's, you know, yeah, the singularity. Essentially, any, any argument is just like, hey, this might be good. I'm just like, no, everything about it will be terrible in the long Which is why I'm showing these, you know, the, Examples of what a singularity could be, you know, full of, full of, uh, full of holes as it were, because and then we'll go from there again. Let me uh, let me just give you a simple pattern. It may or may not be helpful, but it might help to organize your conversations. It's the, it's the pattern of what we call the formal definition. So take the term singularity, right, and ask yourself: Are you disagreeing? Where you have disagreements? Where, where are you disagreeing in your, in your definitions or your understanding of singularity? So what class of things would we put singularity into? Is singularity a revolution? Is it a, uh, is it a, a change in consciousness? Is it something that happens? Is it a physical problem? Physical, is it something that happens historically rather than conceptually? There's all kinds of classifications that you could place this term singularity in. And then once you put the notion of singularity in some kind of a class, and you could be disagreeing over three or four or five of these, right? You, then you, what you want to do over here is you want to tell what makes uh, singularity unique to this particular class that you've discussed, OK? So we could say a, a very simple example. example of Python is a snake, right? But let's say we got into a, a, an argument uh, that where we were questioning whether or not pythons were snakes. 
we might want to say, no, not exactly. It's not a snake. It's more, well, it's a reptile, but it doesn't really fit the category of snake. Okay, are you following me here? So one way to organize your debate is just to say, well, my sense of singularity, the, 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 this, I think this is a useful idea, but I disagree with the way Kurzweil you know, positions it as a kind of thing. And then he's going to say, so if singularity is some kind of historical change, for example, then what makes that historical change unique? Well, it's technological, right, rather than political or something. Right? Is that making sense? Yeah. So, so yeah. One, way to, one way to kind of focus, which is what we're both trying to get you to do, one way to focus this is to try to see if you can work inside of some common uh, uh, structure that will organize your, your disputes. It may, it may help. It may not. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's, a, that's uh, we were going to have a meeting tomorrow. Actually, they're focusing even more on the meeting definitely something. I do like I, I do like the ethical idea of the societal impact and looking at the ethics. I do like that idea. Uh -huh. So you could simply say that singularity is uh, a challenge to traditional ethical. Uh, do you think it would be easiest if we just looked at one? Sure. You could take one. Uh, I mean, look, look at this group here taking <laughs> three words. <laughs> you know, focusing in on that. We that that's kind of a really interesting thing to do. So, um, you know, but you can go very deeply into the nature of why those three words are as they are and what they actually mean in a very similar way. We're looking for something for you need to get into some kind of mode of thinking more like that thing for a little bit. Would you agree, Patrick? Ah, I do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mark. I just wanted to add something. They had said, um, you guys said something about how uh, Chris Wall said that um, technology growth would be like exponential. Basically, yeah. All right. Um, look up, there's an economic model called Solo Growth Model. And it's a really famous model describing um, the steady state of society using technology for population growth and, um, and the savings and how much money it has. Pretty much talks about how it's impossible. So, I mean, it's like, oh, yeah, basic uh, laws of science. Yeah. So they shoot down his arguments almost yeah. right away. But if you look up the solar growth model, it's a great description of how that's not even. You know. So, solar does have steady states, though, though. Hmm? Solar does have steady states. I know it does, but what I'm saying is it wouldn't be exponential for growth. Wow. That's what I'm saying. That's, I, that's I, think, I think solar is growing. It would have to be a steady state, that's what I mean. Okay, any more comments or questions on that one? Well, we're not going to get on to another one today. Who hasn't gone yet? Is there anyone who hasn't spoken? Let's go one more group. Well, you're Thursday, then. Yeah. Next week. But do you want to remind us what your question is before we finish? Um, it was... Exactly. Should, no, uh, should humans exert control over artificial intelligence? Should humans have control? Mm -hmm. um, the thing that jumps out at me at that is the word control. That's a, a good one to start thinking about what control involves. Um, you have a laptop computer. How much do you control it? You don't, you know, the processors calculate things in there all the time. You, what is your level of control? You control so software, potentially you run something, but I can turn it off. You can turn it off, yeah. <laughs> but there is um, one of the things that has come to fascinate me a little bit is the idea of persistent, persistent environments, which we will talk about more when we talk about projecting ourselves into these artificial environments. So World of Warcraft never switches off. That world exists. Damien, there's a an MMO that's I think it's called like the Age of Wushu or something. They're gonna have it so that your character becomes an NPC when you're not when you're online. not there, so your character's still living and working. He could get kidnapped. And, and this idea of control with computers and, and it's the persistency as well, the way things are changing. That my files are now often in shared environments. You know, other people are still working with my work and things like this. So, control is, a, is a, an interesting one in the modern age. An interesting phrase. Yeah, because you, you know, <coughs> is the ro you know these ideas of robots that still do things when I'm not there. 
Um, vacuum cleaners, the little robot vacuum cleaners, the whole point of them is you use them when you're not there. You set them running. And yes, you're the person who switches it on and can switch it off. But this idea of control, it operates autonomously a lot better. In, in uh, Foucault, the name Foucault is often associated with uh, a person who is thinking about uh, what we often talk about in terms of surveillance and the monopticon. But uh, Foucault, it, it, so that, that would be if you. Do you want to explain what the panopticon was a famous prison? Right, so, right. It's a, everybody goes in the center, is not it? Yeah. Right, right. They use the model at the penitentiary I used to uh, visit frequently. Uh, so when I was in college. But anyway. The, the uh, idea here is that it, it may be possible to exert control without a presence. So uh, in the examples that you were giving us, Damien, you were kind of saying, well, there's things that are happening that somehow I'm responsible for in my house, uh, my work, and these things carry on without my presence. Um, but uh, Foucault is basically interested in how we design spaces uh, to control the behavior of people uh, when they may be being watched or they may not be. Mm -hmm. and how uh, we might be able to control others if they internalize certain processes, especially if they internalize this understanding that they're being watched, whether they are or they are not. Uh, that's basically a quick way of talking about the logic of the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So um, control might be uh, something that we'll, we have to think about in terms of presence and absence, but there are highly sophisticated mechanisms that, that precede uh, the, the age of the computer. But the, the very definition of artificial intelligence is a highly sophisticated and the idea of us having control. It's like it's like building a if I, I can build a chess machine that plays better chess than me. So where is the level of control? You know. Right. It, it, it's a fascinating question. Right. Control may not merely be um, assertion of will. I guess it's the, mm. is, is sort of if we were, if we were arguing about this. Control issue. implies understanding as well. I, I guess we, in part what I'm doing is I'm sort of challenging the classification within which you are uh, understanding the, the, yeah. the, the word control. But I'm not disagreeing. You know, I'm just saying that it's actually been the discussions about control have been wired out. Now, in, in certain uh, theories of knowledge, the, instead of privileging control, control is seen as a failure of intelligence, uh, as a failure of understanding, as a way in which understanding can go wrong. And, uh, and so what, what's opposed to control in these conversations is something like playfulness. But that, that makes sense to me. You know, to me, if you're building an artificial intelligence and you have to control it, then you fail at building the artificial intelligence. The whole point is it should have some form of autonomy, yeah. which is a portion of its intelligence. So, yeah. uh, I think you've got an interesting question there. Yeah, it's a great yeah. control. Are these the kind of things you're talking about, or are we? Uh, yeah, in a, in a roundabout way. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're professors, we always talk in a roundabout way. It yeah. goes with the job. <laughs> Is there some reason why control service for you? Uh, should you, it's what should humans have control over? Um, it or, actually wasn't even my question. Well, yeah. uh, oh, it came from the novel game. And that's where
the ideas of the time theory of mind, reason and emotion, can does does it need to be emotion involved with artificial intelligence? And then we branched out into the arguments that Roland Bob Barnes makes in Life to Death and Longer and um, similar to um, the code, but a difference say, when it comes to the author function. And so this idea of separation of author and work is very parallel between uh, someone who creates artificial intelligence or someone that like work. Is there a connection between how an author goes about creating the text and how um, at least one of the art that the text is out there is how the world the author has a more uh, connection to the So that has to come up by there is this there is this grand tradition in science fiction of um, creators have an attachment to their creations, starting with Frankenstein, of course. So from there onwards, you know. Uh, uh, it's the it's it part. It's uh, 